Hi. This is the Behringer DeepMind. An analog synth with a comprehensive digital effects section. It comes in desktop and keyboard versions with either 6 or 12 voices, an extensive modulation matrix and modulation capabilities, arpeggiator, dozens of effects with software control if you want it, even over Wi-Fi. This video is split into three parts, a beginner-friendly overview of what this synth can do, then some patch ideas and hacks with some of the special features of DeepMind, and then finally a pros and cons section. And if you want to cut to the chase, you can use the timeline on the left. Let's start with a hardware overview. The overall slider layout is very similar to a vintage Roland Juno, but DeepMind does so much more, it really shouldn't be looked at as a clone, but rather as something that uses the traditional layout and sound as a starting point and inspiration for a whole lot more. The first indication that you're not in vintage synth Kansas anymore is front and center, a very large and informative LCD screen. Its viewing angles and refresh rate aren't great, and it doesn't use OLED like the cool kids, but the information it gives is very useful, and I'll take a bigger LCD over a smaller OLED any day. It is a weakness, but you sort of forget about it when you actually start using the synth. That said, if there's ever a Deep Mind Mark II, this is the first thing I think they should improve on. There is a companion PC, Mac, and iOS app that behaves like a large touchscreen and can be quite useful. It can control all the synth parameters over Wi-Fi. I'll show you that later on. The key bed is four octaves. It's velocity sensitive with aftertouch and performs nicely. On the back are MIDI in, out, and through. Quarter inch headphones and balanced stereo line outs. Sustain and expression pedal inputs, which can also function as CV and gate inputs. And USB for MIDI and patch control, but not audio. DeepMind has a built-in power supply, so thanks very much for one less thing to worry about. DeepMind's oscillators and filters are analog, but it is all digitally controlled, meaning that you can save presets, over a thousand of those in eight banks of 128 presets. A small but brilliant feature here, which I don't know why isn't adopted by every synth with presets, is that if you create a new preset or make changes to an existing one and then change a preset by mistake without saving your work, there's a simple undo function that lets you go right back to where you were. Anyway, back to the overview. The panel more or less represents the elements of a synth voice, including two oscillators, a low pass filter, and for modulation, two LFOs, and three envelopes with curve controls on a per stage basis, something you don't see in many synths. You've got polyphony and unison voice controls here, and an arpeggiator sequencer section on the left, along with pitch bend and mod wheels. And then finally, on the right, voice controls LEDs, which will show you how you're using your 12 or six voices, depending on the version of DeepMind you have. Since there are way more functions on DeepMind than sliders, there are two additional layers of accessibility to parameters. The first is a secondary function for some of the sliders if you hold their edit button in the module, for example, holding the LFO button will let you change the LFO shape. There isn't a direct on panel control for that function. And then for even more depth, pressing the edit button exposes additional parameters for that module. To complete the overview, audio flows from the oscillators through the filter low pass then into the VCA, finally through the high pass filter, which applies to all the voices and then through onto the effects section, which you can configure as a send in parallel as an insert in the signal chain or entirely bypass it if you want. Let's take a look at the main screen. It gives you a visualization of the three envelopes on the bottom, the current parameter you're editing on the left. So for example, for LFO rate, you have a visualization of the rate over here, then an indication of where the parameter is at over here, as well as what the preset value is right down here. Some parameters will give you a really nice visualization for what's impacting them. So for example, for the filter cutoff, you can see that right now LFO2 and the envelope aren't doing anything to it. But if I increase the mod depth, you can see the range of modulation. If I increase the envelope mod depth, we'll talk about this later, by the way, you can see this arrow representing it. And if I invert the modulation direction, it'll go that way. And if I add resonance, right, you'll see a visualization of the peak over here. As I mentioned before, the screen will occasionally turn into a menu system for editing parameters of a specific section. For example, if I wanted to edit the effects, right, I've got the general effect configuration here and menu items I can 
move around for the overall effect types and mix levels. And then if I hit effects again, this will happen across multiple modules. I can cycle between the different pages in that module. One of the things you'll encounter in a synth with presets is that the physical position of the sliders doesn't necessarily or necessarily doesn't represent the actual position of the parameters in the preset. The compare screen gives you nice access to all the different slider positions, both where they are now and where they should be to match the preset. And you can cycle through these different pages like this. So for example, uh, let's pick uh, VCA decay, right? You can see that right now the slider position is over here, but the little arrow here is telling us, hey, if you want to match where the preset is at, you've got to push it all the way up. And now we're at the preset level. If you want to load up an init preset, you just hold program and compare. And then if you want to load all the slider positions into the preset, you hold program and write. Revert to panel. Right. And now these are all implemented in what we're hearing. This is my init preset. The slider positions are set to it now. I like this a little bit better than the default program that this comes with. Let's take a look at the sound engine and a good place to start is the oscillators. DeepMind has two of them as well as a noise generator for percussive sounds or any number of things like adding grit or a bit of lo-fi to your sound. The oscillators are DCOs, not VCOs. DCOs, by the way, are not digital oscillators, but rather digitally controlled analog oscillators. Oscillator one generates both a sawtooth or square wave or both. And you've got pulse width control for the square. Doesn't go quite to zero. And pulse width isn't worth much without pulse width modulation. There's a shortcut for activating this. You hold edit and then move this up and you can choose the mod source for pulse width modulation. So I can go with say LFO one, right? So I can increase depth now using this and rate using this. you've got pulse width modulation. So that's oscillator one. Unfortunately, there's no level control for oscillator one. You can just turn it on or off, turn either of its shapes both on or off. Let's take a look at oscillator two. This does have level control. It only has one core shape, which is a square wave, but it has a tone mod function, which sort of splits it apart with another square wave and is really cool to kind of metallic sound which is different, I think, than pulse width modulation and gives it nice extra character. You've got pitch control for oscillator two, which is relative to oscillator one, right? So you can have short intervals for a nice detune or just go for different semitone intervals. Up to an octave up. Or an octave down to use this as a sub oscillator. Then finally, oscillator two has an ability to sync to oscillator one, which gives it these characterful oscillator sync sounds. Notice, by the way, the pitch of oscillator two needs to be above that of oscillator one to hear this. If it drops below, it won't have much effect. If you want to use this range, you can always go into edit and then transpose oscillator one down, right? So right now it's here, let's transpose it down. Now oscillator sync will work across a broader range. For additional parameters, both oscillators have a menu where you can toggle between oscillator one parameters and oscillator two parameters, and they each have their own pitch mod slider which is tied to LFO one by default, but you can change that as well. And you can get into FM rates and you can also key sync LFO one. We'll talk about that when we get to the mod matrix. By the way, I'll show you a nice trick on how to decouple oscillator two from oscillator one later in the patch hacks section. Now, while two oscillators may seem a little bit limited compared to mono synths you may be familiar with, you've got two oscillators per voice. So that's six sets of two oscillators or 12 sets of oscillators, depending on which version of DeepMind you have. So I've got two oscillators layered here, but if I wanted to add additional intervals, I could turn on the chord feature, program my own chord, let's say just this for example, and then each note, 
will play four oscillators using two voices, as you can see here. Now, aside from stacking notes like that in chord mode, you've also got unison mode, which will let you increasingly stack voices. So this is two at a time, three at a time, and you can increase detune. All right, add more. Obviously this impacts polyphony, because we're using more voices for every key we press. But we can take this all the way up to 12 if we want. And there are additional analog style drift parameters here. Right, we can increase through something like this. Put a nice unison style sound. So with some effect, this can sound pretty massive. By the way, while we're on the topic of polyphony and unison, if you hit this button again, you get access to a few additional parameters like transposing everything or portamento. And if you hit it again, there are options for polychaining DeepMind with more DeepMinds if you need more polyphony. Before we move on to the filter, let's not forget our little noise generator. All right, so we have that too, pink noise. And that's pretty much it for the noise generator. Let's move on to the filter. The main filter is a low pass voltage controlled filter, which means we can filter out higher frequencies based on the cutoff point, right? So any frequency above the cutoff point will get filtered. It's actually easier to see this with noise, right? As we filter out the higher frequencies. And then resonance is an emphasis at the cutoff point And the resonance will self-oscillate if we crank it up, meaning it will make its own tone even if we shut down the noise in the main oscillator. Right? So this is a like a sine wave oscillator. And you can track this with the keyboard. Right? So you can play this filter. If you wanted, keyboard tracking is also useful to make sure that filtering stays consistent as you play up and down the keyboard. The filter has both two pole and four pole options, right? So the four pole option is a steeper slope. It filters out frequencies faster. And then the two pole option is more gentle, leaves in more of the frequencies and is better for polyphony. But there's less chance that what you play will be filtered out. The filter's character is very similar to Roland filters. Right, this is without resonance. Let's crank up resonance a bit. Right, very sharp. Notice, by the way, that when we bring up resonance, there's a reduction in bass. Right, so let's look at before, look at levels before. And as we increase resonance, we've got a reduction in levels. Now this reduction in bass can be either a good or bad thing, depending on your preference, right? It does give more place and space for the filter. But if you want, you have a bass boost function in the high pass filter, right? that helps compensate for this slightly. It's an overall increase in bass, right? So it increases levels, whether the filter, whether resonance is on or not. But it does help to get a bit of the bass back if it is. While we're on the topic of filters, even though the high pass filter isn't per voice, but rather an overall effect, it filters out frequencies on the low end, letting the higher frequencies pass through. Now, by the way, even though unlike its VCF and VCA voltage controlled counterparts, it doesn't say VHPF here or voltage controlled high pass filter, its cutoff frequency actually is a destination in the mod matrix, which is a good segue to discussing modulation overall. So modulation is a fancy word for having DeepMind move sliders or one of the many other parameters that aren't represented by sliders for us to create motion in our sounds so we don't have to, right? So I could move the pulse width slider manually, but it would be much better if I got a robot or an LFO to do that for me. 
So repetitive motions are typically done by LFO. One-time motions are typically done by envelopes, right? So I could move the pitch here manually, but an envelope will do it much faster for me. There are plenty of modulation sources on DeepMind, like say, for example, pitch bend or the mod wheel. Let's start with the LFOs, which are repetitive motions and the envelopes, which are one-time motions. For the most part though, they can loop as well. There are three basic things you need to think about when you program a modulation. The modulation source, right, LFO or envelope or mod wheel, modulation depth, which is the extent of the modulation, and then destination, which is which parameter you're going to modulate. Now, some of these connections are pre-made for us. Let's start with the LFOs. DeepMind has two of those, and by default, they're connected to a few destinations. So for example, by default, LFO one is connected to modulate the pitch of oscillators one and two, but it won't do it unless we increase the mod depth, right? So the connection is there, LFO one, to the pitch of, of oscillator one, but nothing's gonna happen until we increase the depth. Right, now we can mess around with the rate. Another thing you need to know about modulation that besides the source, destination, and depth, you also have a modulation shape. So this up and down motion and pitch is a triangle wave modulation. I can hold this and change the shape to sine wave, which is similar to triangle, square, right? Up, down motions, ramp up, ramp down, sample and hold, which is a fancy name for a random LFO, and then a slewed sample and hold, which will glide between random positions. So this is what slewed sample and hold sounds like, and then stepped sample and hold sounds like this. And as I mentioned, you can get into frequency modulation or rapid modulation territory with the LFO as well. Another neat on-panel control is delay time. So right now we have the LFO doing this, but if you wanted to gradually fade in, we can increase delay time, which will both cause it to wait a bit as I press a key and bring in the modulation gradually. As you can see, and here. Aside from this, if you press edit, you have access to a few more parameters, like whether the LFO will sync to key presses and sync to the arpeggiator, as well as clock divisions, right? Which is nice. And you can also determine whether the LFO will sync across all the voices or each LFO do its own thing. Okay, so we talked about LFOs. You've got two of them, they're identical. Let's talk about the envelopes. You've got three envelopes and they're identical as well. The only difference is that the first two are automatically mapped to this one to the VCA and then the second one to the VCF, to the filter, right? So the VCA envelope is what you typically think of when you think of envelopes, which is attack a gradual increase in level. And the, this determines the time it takes to reach the peak level, then decay, which is a decrease to the sustain level, also measured in time, right? So, which will go up, down, then stabilize at the sustain level, and then release determines how long it takes a note to die down. So it can be either quick or take a while. Now in most synths, you've got either four sliders or four knobs controlling ADSR, but this distinction is important. Attack, decay, and release are measured in time, and sustain is measured in level. This comes pretty naturally when thinking of the level of a sound, but when it comes to modulating other parameters, it becomes a little less intuitive. So let's take a look, for example, at the filter envelope. And I guess the easiest way to explain this is just with a decay and I'll increase resonance and take the filter down. Okay, so let's take this sound for example. Now I need to increase the depth, right? The envelope doesn't do anything unless we increase its depth. And as we do, this decay motion reduces the filter cutoff frequency. Now the visualization here is a little bit misleading, right? Because it's positive modulation, even though we're taking the filter cutoff down because we're looking at the decay part. If we just look at the attack part, right? It'll go up. And we can also invert 
the direction as well. Right? So now we're taking attack will take the filter cut off down and decay will bring it up. So this takes a little bit getting used to, but ultimately we've got a modulation source, which is the envelope here, routed to the filter cutoff frequency by default, and the depth of that motion is determined by this slider in this case. As I mentioned, there are three of these. If you don't want this to impact the filter, just turn this down and then use the mod matrix to route this envelope or any of the other envelopes to any other parameter on the panel or you know, any other parameter available in the menu system. We'll get to this when we talk about the mod matrix. Now, just to add a little bit more complexity, envelopes here have curves. Now, so look at the curve of this envelope right now, right? That's this thing here. That's what it currently looks like. So it's a fast initial motion, which is tempered down. But if I hit the curves button here, I could change the curve of this modulation to anywhere from dome-shaped, to an even deeper slide. Slide style, fast. And linear. And dome-like. Which accelerates towards the end. Okay, now remember I said that sustain is a level rather than a motion over time? Well, not so much when you start to mess with its curve, right? So let's take this motion, for example and start increasing the sustain curve, which is really sort of like a swerve up or ramp up. Right? After the initial motion of the attack and the decay. So that's what happens when the sustain level is zero. If we increase sustain, we can then ramp its curve down, right? Like this. And we can make it quicker as well. So those are pretty nice and interesting and complex style envelopes that you don't see in any synth. Now, just to make things even slightly more interesting, let's go back to a snappier envelope. Right? You can set envelopes to loop as well. So if you hit the VCF or any other envelope button, you see this menu. And right now it's triggered by a key, but if I change this parameter, I can trigger it with an LFO or just set it to loop, right? So how cool is that? And all of these parameters, attack decay and so on, can be modulation destinations in the mod matrix, which we will get to next. So let's talk about the mod matrix, typically the most dreaded part of a synth, but really when you think of it, we've been mod matrixing all this time. When we brought up the LFO to modulate the pitch of the oscillator, we hooked up the source to a destination and we determined the depth of that modulation. And the matrix is really just eight more slots that let you connect any source in DeepMind to any destination, even those that aren't on the panel. There are eight slots here, so you can make eight of these connections. You select a modulation source using the click encoder or by the way, the uh, data entry fader, right? But it's much easier to just go through them like this. There aren't that many, but there still are quite a few. Let's take, for example, the uh, mod wheel. Let's use that. Then you can determine depth, again, either using the click encoder or positive or negative depth using the data entry slider. And then you can pick any one of a number of destinations there are I think over 130 of those here, including, by the way, effect parameters, which is a feature that's really unique to DeepMind, and you can quick scroll through these as well, right? The effect parameters will appear once you pick an effect, we'll get to that in a bit. But let's, in this case, just go with something simple and go with the VCF frequency. So now we can control the filter frequency with the mod wheel. I'll add some resonance so we can hear it a bit more. Right? Now, what you need to know about polarity is that you start at the starting point of where the parameter currently is and either go up or down for it, especially in the case of a mod wheel, not so much in the case of the LFOs. Right? So if the parameter is all the way down, we can bring it up and we can impact its position. But if it starts from a high position and the modulation depth has a positive polarity, this won't do anything. Right? We need to go into here 
set polarity to negative, and then we can impact a parameter that's at its high point with positive modulation. So an important thing to know, and if you need to run through that again, you can rewind, of course. All right, we talked about the mod matrix and survived. Let's talk about the effects section. You've got four effects slots, and any effect can be any number of dozens of different effects. As I mentioned before, the effects can be either as sends, inserts, or just bypassed altogether if you want. The default routing is having each of them route into each other, but you can select from 10 other layouts, right? Including a few which have feedback. We'll explore that in a bit, but let's just keep it simple for now. Once you've got your routing, you can go down here, select the effect type. Right, so the reverb here is really sweet. You can keep populating these in uh, you know any order you like. Let's just stick for the reverb for now. You've got mix control, and you can use this as well. And then each effect has a bunch of different parameters which you can access by pressing the effects button. All right, so for example, decay. written here, right? So it's a little bit hard to understand it from these little uh, abbreviations on top, but you've got tone, control here, right? Pre-delay if you like, so it can wait a bit before starting. Then mix, which is the same parameter that we saw before. And there are a few presets here, so this is the church preset, the room, spring, and so on. And there are a bunch of other reverb effects beside this one. Now this effect is relatively simple, but if we pick one with more parameters, let's say, for example, uh, any one of these, the compressor, for example, right? There are a bunch more parameters that you can change. Now you can go through these manually like this. I highly recommend getting acquainted with the effects using the iOS app or PC or Mac app. I'll show you that in a bit. Let's complete the panel tour. We have an arpeggiator and sequencer section we didn't talk about up until now. Right, so an arpeggiator is what you'd expect. We've got rate control. Right, gate time. You can hold it if you like by pressing this button. Then if you hit edit, you have access to a bunch more controls, you know, adding additional octaves. Stuff you'd expect. Q, down, up, down. And alternating modes. Clock divider. So you can adjust the arpeggiator tempo, say, in relation to an external source. There's swing control. And then aside from that, you've got a few arpeggiator patterns, right? So these won't change the notes that an arpeggiator plays, but it will change their velocity and gate. Now there are a few presets, I think uh, yeah, 32 of those. And there are also user patterns that you can program and you do that by hitting yes, right? And you can change say the pattern length up to 32. If I want the velocity in the pattern to be audible, I need to make sure that my preset is velocity sensitive. Right now it isn't, right? But if I increase the slider, it will become sensitive to velocity. Let's maybe put it somewhere in the middle. And when we get back to the patterns, let's go into here and, right? Now, the velocity in the pattern does impact. Uh, let's do here, edit this guy here. Okay. Does impact what we hear. Okay, so there are quite a few built in presets with different velocities and gate. And increase rate of it. And aside from the 32 preset slots, you can program your own. Right, so there are user slots. You can change the length, for example. Oh, here. Then go step by step and edit either velocity 
using the fader, right? Or the gate length. And that's how you edit the arpeggiator patterns. So that's the arpeggiator. Let's talk about the sequencer, which you access by hitting the edit button one more time, right? So this is the control sequencer. Now this doesn't sequence notes by default, though I'll show you how, but rather sequences parameter motion. So let me explain. This is the sound I've got on now, and I'll enable this. Nothing happens because I didn't assign the control sequencer to any destination in the mod matrix, right? Let's take a look at the sequence, by the way, by going into here. Okay, so this is my current sequence. There's nothing programmed into it. I can change its length like we did before. Let's just take a short sequence just to make this easy. Then go ahead and edit its values, right? So let's do that. Let's set this value here and this value here and then this one here. And again, we're not hearing anything because we didn't hook this up to any destination. To do that, we need to go into the mod matrix, right? So let's do that. Go into here, mod matrix. Look for the control sequencer as a mod source. Here we go, control sequencer. Set depth, say all the way up. And then let's go for, say, filter cutoff frequency. Now that we have that set up, we can hear the modulation. Not very exciting, but maybe we go back into here, into the sequencer, and then say maybe increase its rate. Right. Now we're getting somewhere. So that's the control sequencer. Later on, I'll show you how to sequence notes with this. Okay, let's turn this off for now and talk about chord and polychord modes. Right, so I briefly touched on chord mode before. You just hit record, punch in the chord you like, and you can transpose that chord anywhere you want on the keyboard. So that's chord. Polychord is actually pretty cool. It lets you program a chord for every single key on the keyboard. So you can play any of the keys that aren't programmed as chords normally. But if you hit a key that is a chord, for example, this one, right, it will play a chord. There's a chord wizard, or you can just program your own chords. So say if I wanted to program this key as a chord, just hit record and then program my chord. Okay. So that's polychord mode. And like I mentioned, the keys that you don't program as chords will still function as usual, right? Which is a really cool way, I think, to use DeepMind. Let's move on and take a look at a few additional interesting settings. The VCA menu, I touched that briefly earlier has a nice pen spread option, right? So as you play, the voices will be panned across the stereo field, which is cool. And then there's a global settings menu. We won't go over all of these because each of these little arrows represents another sub menu. I'll just say that there are a bunch of MIDI options, as you can see here, uh, USB settings, take a quick look here, Wi-Fi settings as well, right? This is what you use to connect to your Wi-Fi. So let's talk about that. Through the magic of editing and wireless technology, we now have an iPad with an app that is completely in sync with the DeepMind 12. So notice, for example, as I change presets, right, everything here will change on screen to reflect the changes that are going on inside DeepMind. Now, while there are Mac and iOS versions of this, I think it's most useful and fun to use it on an iPad because of the touch screen and the fact that it connects wirelessly to the DeepMind. This main overview tab lets you control any of the parameters. Then you have a preset manager tab that lets you browse around your presets. Preset Blender, which is cool, and we'll get to that. Effects Control, which I think is the most useful aspect of this app where you can choose any of the effects and then go ahead and edit their parameters very clearly. You've got a visual representation of the control sequencer, if there are any sequencers in there, and the arpeggiator presets. And then you have 
additional settings controls to hook up to the DeepMind. It even syncs up to the level of showing you which voices you're using. So like I said, personally, I don't feel the need to edit parameters like this. I don't think it's any easier than using the onboard panel. But like I said, where I think this shines is particularly with the effects, right? It's really nice to be able to see the different effects you've got on board, the routing, as well as control any one of the parameters. Let me choose my initial preset, something that isn't as effect heavy, right? So if I wanted to scroll through the different routing options, I could easily do that here. Let's just pick the simple one again. If I wanted to add an effect, you just tap here, this empty space. Let's say I'll add a um, distortion here, right? So if I want to add some low drive, it's as easy as touching this, mid drive, high drive. Right, super simple to edit this way. If I didn't like this, wanted to change it for something else, let's just say this guy. Right, again, add crunch, drive, buzz. Super easy. Let's say I wanted to add a reverb on top of that, right? Let's go for this guy never disappoints. How nice is that? So that's the effects. Let's talk about the preset blender. The idea here is that you can load up any four presets into the blender and then mix between them. So let's go to these presets, right? This is what, here we go. Blue Dolphin sounds like. And then this guy is chord play, right? With this pattern. And this guy is heaven pad. Let's put this here. Oops. Okay. And then fourth one, let's go for yeah, which rises is fine. Okay. So these are the four presets that I have in the blender. Let's maybe go for this effect section. So this doesn't always work perfectly, but you can, right? Sort of morph between them for <laughs> interesting variations. And these timbres in between the presets. Let's just take a look at how the visualization works, because that's cool too, I guess. Right? So if I turn on the arpeggiator here, right, that's this pattern, this pattern. I could edit these if I wanted. Right. Change them. So certainly nice if you have an iPad laying around the house. This applies, by the way, to editing control sequences as well, right? So just touch to change values. Okay, so that was the general overview of DeepMind. Now let's take a look at a few hidden gems that might help you get more out of it. Let's go through these quickly. Most synths have velocity sensitivity. I showed you that before in the VCA menu, but this one also has velocity release or velocity off sensitivity. So we access that in the mod matrix and go and look for not note velocity, but rather note off velocity. And I guess the most intuitive thing to map this to is release. So I want a quick release to be like this, but I want a long release, you know, to be maybe something like this. So I want to reduce the release time based on the speed that I leave a note. So first I need to map this to, right? Envelope, VCA envelope one, envelope one release. And then I want to map this to reverse polarity, right? So a quick release will quickly change this parameter or modify it a lot. And then a slow release will slowly release the note. Now this may seem trivial, but not a lot of synths can do this, right? So you can play a chord and release it or play a chord and gently release it. Next up, you heard me complain before that DeepMind has only two oscillators, though I showed you a way around that. There is an effect called dual pitch, which makes it really easy to add additional quote unquote oscillators to your voice. Now I can select this through here, but I've got the app around, so why not just do that? Go into here, an empty slot, and the effect that I'm looking for is dual pitch. 
which is right here. Again, I can edit all these parameters here, right? So let's say the mix parameter, notice as I change it here, it changes here as well. Anyway, this is my one little oscillator. Let's add a couple. All right, and you can determine how these oscillators will be transposed over here. Again, either on the iPad, or on the controls here, right? Go into this guy. So that's how to add more oscillators if you want. Now, you know those harmonizer effects? You can do that with this guy as well by adding a delay to each note. So let's say for example, I'll choose, you know, seven semitones here, but I want this to happen after a bit, right? Then this guy, let's make this an octave above, but I want to wait a bit more. So I'll add delay, right? How cool is that? Now, if we add a reverb to that, we're beginning to see a little shimmer effect. But the real way to make shimmer here is with a feedback loop. So let's take a look, for example, at this preset. That shimmer effect is a result of a feedback loop continuously pitching up the sound, looping into itself and coming out the reverb. You can just as easily create a shimmer down effect by moving these into negative territories, right? And why just go up and down when we can go all around? I created this little insane shimmer effect, which basically takes these parameters and just modulates them all the time with the LFOs. Right, so this is what the mod matrix looks like. Nice madness. Let's move on to some other hidden gems. Take a blank preset. The Vintage Room Reverb has, among other, a freeze function. So you can take a chord or anything else, play it, freeze it, add notes to it. So it's always good to know you've got freeze. Let's move on. Remember I said the control sequencer isn't designed to sequence notes? Well, apparently it can if it really wants to. So if we go into the control sequencer, right? And then start editing a new pattern. So let's trim this pattern down to four steps just for the sake of this example. And let's say that I wanna have the first step just be at the root note and then transpose this step maybe, um, Let's go for four semitones. It's always easier to use this for precise control. And I want this step to be, say, nine semitones. And then, oh, here we go, this step to be 12 semitones. Well, we've got the app around. Let's take a look at that here, right? So this is what this looks like. And I've got this set up so that when I hit a note, it steps through the sequence. Obviously nothing's happening yet because we didn't assign this to anything in the mod matrix. Now it turns out that if I go into the mod matrix and choose control sequencer, there you are as my source, bring up modulation depth all the way up, then choose the pitch of one of the oscillators or both as a destination. Let's go for this. Then I now have a note sequence applied when I play. Now, all the control sequencer parameters apply to this, so I could have it uh, loop, for example, if I wanted. Right, just, just repeat. Or if I wanted, uh, say, apply swing to it. Right, or anything else, clock divisions. Let's get rid of swing. Well, cool. 
So now we've got a sequence, and this can be up to 32 steps long if I want it, right? Just by increasing this and adding more notes. Let's just keep it here. So that's nice, but what if I wanted to play on top of this sequence? I couldn't because each note that I'd hit would transpose the sequence. Now the only way to truly get around this is to hook up an external sequencer to DeepMind and then you could play on top of that. But what if you don't have one or just interested in sort of different polyrhythmic approaches like I'll show you now? Well, there's a little trick that we can play on DeepMind to let it play one sequence using the control sequencer and another with a keyboard. So the way this trick works is by assigning the control sequencer to one oscillator and freezing it and then playing with the other one. So let's first assign the control sequencer, say just oscillator one, right? Now oscillator two will just play whatever note I'm holding. Now they'll both transpose. What I want now is for oscillator one not to transpose as I play higher or lower notes. The way to do that is go to another slot, look for note number, right? So this uses the number of the note that we play as a modulation source, and then apply that to the pitch of oscillator one as well, but with negative depth. This has the effect of basically disconnecting the keyboard from oscillator one. And now I can play on top of the sequence with oscillator two, and oscillator one is just doing its thing. Now this does make this paraphonic for a single voice, but I think it's a cool effect. Let's take a listen to this in the context of a more flushed out sequence. Right? So this is our control sequence. It's transposing one of the oscillators. It's just an interesting effect. Again, you could get an external sequencer and play over that just as well. Let's move on. Typically, when you change a preset in DeepMind, right, there's a brief pause. Right? What if you wanted to change presets without a pause? Well, you can't exactly, and you can use the preset blender I showed you before. But let's take, for example, changes that I make to a preset. Let's say this and this. The compare function lets you go back to the original preset as it was. So you sort of have one state, which is the changes that you made to a preset. And then when you hit this, you can seamlessly go to a different state without pausing the effects because compare doesn't apply to the effects, right? So it's a nice way to sort of change your timbre from two different presets with one push of a button. Let's move on. While there is no analog distortion in DeepMind, you can make gain your friend with the effects section. All right, so this is a sound. That's certainly very hard to replicate on the original Juno and I think is pretty nice. Moving on, I spoke about feedback in effects as a way to create shimmer, but just feedback on its own is something that if you're willing to take the risk sonically, very interesting to explore. Next up, a note on macro controls. Some synth have macro knobs, which let you control more than one parameter at once. You don't have dedicated knobs like that in DeepMind, but you can go into the mod matrix and assign the same parameter, the same source, to multiple destinations and effectively get a kind of macro control. So for example, in this preset, the mod wheel is controlling both the filter frequency and the resonance. Now aside from these, which are special to DeepMind, there are plenty more tricks that you can apply to DeepMind in my book, more on that later. But one last hidden gem that I wanted to talk about regarding DeepMind is the Sustenuto mode. So I've gone ahead and hooked up a sustain pedal to DeepMind. And the way sustain pedals typically work in the sustain mode is that when you hold them, and I'll press it now, you'll have to take my word on it, as I add notes, they get added, right? But you can't really play on top of that 
because it'll just keep adding nodes and become a mess. Sustenuto mode works differently. You play a few notes, and then hold the pedal down. It'll freeze those notes, but it'll let you play additional notes without holding them. And if I wanted to change the chord, say to this, I leave the sustenuto pedal, notice they're still holding, leave it, hold these guys down, press it again, I have to take my word on that as well, then play on top of that. All right. So that is sustenuto. Okay, let's talk about pros and cons. On the cons side, there are a few things. There's no dedicated level control for Oscillator 1, neither as a standalone slider or as a modulation destination in the mod matrix. DeepMind also doesn't have a sequencer. There's a workaround like I showed you before, but it's not a true sequencer, and it doesn't have a polyphonic sequencer like some other polyphonic synths have. DeepMind is monotambral, meaning it can play only one type of sound at a time. Some polyphonic synths let you play two different presets with keyboard splits or as overlays. Furthermore, DeepMind has an amazing effect section, but there's no input in the back for external audio, which would have been really nice considering the awesome effects that are built in here. On the synth engine side, DeepMind has only two oscillators, not three like you may find on a few other synths in the category. That said, I've shown you a few workarounds for that, so the issue isn't really the number of oscillators, but rather the tonal variety that they give you here. You've got Tone Mod, PWM, and Oscillator Sync. That's pretty much it, as opposed to, say, a wavetable oscillator or even a single cycle options. Obviously, you'd need a hybrid digital or digital synth for that to work. I also want to address some not cons, meaning complaints I've seen elsewhere, but I don't think are a big issue. A lot of people talk about the fan noise, and it is indeed loud if you set it to the maximum speed, but I've reduced it to around 30 and have left this on for days with no repercussions. I've heard you can reduce it to zero and it'll be fine. Frankly, if I hear it at 30, it just means I'm not playing loud enough. Another non-con, so to call it, is the claims that there's too much menu diving in DeepMind. I don't think so. I think that you've got control over basic tone parameters on the panel. The direct control over every single parameter would have meant a much bigger and more expensive synth. The only place where I feel the pain is the menus in the effects section, and that's where I highly recommend using the companion app at least when creating your own presets or getting to know the effects, later on it's less of an issue. On the pro side, while the core tone engine in DeepMind may lack the timbral diversity you may find on other synths, the built-in effects more than make up for that. While you can get a whole effects pedal board or rack for your other synths, I'm a big fan of built-in effects because the effects settings can be saved as part of a preset, something you can't do with external effects. And the icing on the cake is that most of the effects parameters appear as modulation destinations in the mod matrix, something you certainly can't get with an external pedal board. Further, on the pros side, I think that the hardware build, the onboard controls with additional options and menus if you're up for that, alongside the price, which is extremely competitive, much more so, by the way, than when DeepMind was initially launched, make DeepMind an extremely compelling value proposition well worth considering even in today's increasingly crowded market with both analog synths as well as digital synths with great sounding virtual analog engines and effects. So that's it for DeepMind. If you want a whole bunch more ideas, tips, and tricks for things you can do with DeepMind or other synths, check out my book available to people who support the work on this channel on Patreon. If you want to see more content like this, don't forget to hit the notification bell after you subscribe. Hit like if this was useful. Feel free to ask me any questions below. Thanks for watching.